what we will see this time around, I think, is that we will first see a deflationary bust, which means that uh, it's the normal thing that we see into the financial crisis. Uh, markets are starting to uh, to decline because, uh, yeah, values are you know disappearing, so to speak, because we see uh, you know uh, uh, you know black swan, we see uh, banks in Japan, something happens there that can have global consequences, and we'll see that has a contagion effect into to other uh, countries as well uh, and, and into the US. And then when the Fed then steps in later on, because that will go on for a little while, the Fed one, and first we'll say, yeah, we will make sure we'll adjust rates, we'll do a little, and at some point they'll say, okay, this is bad. Something's happening, something is teetering here, something is uh, wobbling, something big. Then they will say, okay, we get in, we move in with a big you know, bazooka and they will put all the money into the, that, that, that we think it needs. So you recently shared that wealth cannot be created by credit expansion. For a while, it can create the perception of wealth. Today, market capitalization to GDP stands at about 200%. So you, you touched on this a little bit earlier. You mentioned some major tops that we've experienced. In 1929, 109%. In 2000, 130%. In 2007, 105%. Today, 200%. What does that really mean to the average person out there? It means that everybody thinks that they have done fantastic, that they, they have, you know, a lot of money in their, uh, in their investments and that they think that they have a lot of, you know, value and that they will, and that this is, uh, you know, we are now in a new kind of world that things are moving up or they have done fantastic investment in, in investing in NVIDIA or whatever they have invested into. And what they will understand at some point is that yes, if you get out, if you actually sell now or sell at some point when you, when you see it, you know, you know, at this point here would, be, would probably be good for many people, but you will see that that otherwise that wealth will not be taken away, but it'll, you know, demolish or, or erode because you will see that the market starts to, to come down. So so that is the perception of wealth that we have right now, but the, that can change quickly. And if you know, for there, we only need, you know, 10 people to buy a Facebook uh, star meta stock at a certain price to then have that price but if you know people are starting to sell you will see that everybody that that bought it you know the, those devils will start to see that their that their uh, investment in that particular stock has has moved down a lot so so the the wealth uh, understanding is because the markets have been pumped up with all the money and uh, and especially when you've had interest rates moving to zero you could have you know extreme valuations on on, on stocks so anything that created a dividend you can say, well, you know, just to have a small dividend, then we can you know, justify, you know, high valuation levels. And that's why we have seen a lot of companies and a lot of new starting companies, also uh, startups that that simply do not have a, a sound business uh, uh, rational, uh, especially not in a in again, what I'll say in a normal interest kind of world uh, where the interest levels are three, two, three, four percent. I'm not saying it's going to be there right now because I think it's going to drop lower. But, but that is what a normal business should be able to cope with. Not that you have to have zero percent interest rates in order to attract capital. Because we know that when, when interest rates are going to zero, well, then the, uh, the, the, the dislocation of, of capital stuff begins because people will start and say, hey, I get zero percent here. I, there's no interest. There's no way to get yield. So why don't I push it into this something speculative? And then uh, you'll see market, yield, uh, sorry, market valuation on that particular asset will move up. So I think the, the perception of wealth is something that we all see and feel right now. And I, especially in the crypto market, that's again, people that have earned a lot of money with Dogecoin, for instance, let's say sitting on those right now. Well, uh, what is the value of Doge at the, some, at, at, you know, when we see a liquidity crunch or if, uh, you know, uh, uh, interest rates are moving up again, I don't think it's, it's, it's very high. Uh, honestly, I think it's only based on the, assumption that somebody's going to come buy it for me at a higher price if they don't well then it can decline and it can decline to zero because there's no yield behind it so i think this is where we uh we, we will see that we live in the bubble world and it's so difficult to understand that when you're living on that bubble it's it's quite nice everybody feels good and then you know and you hate the guy who says well you are sitting on a bubble but but it, it doesn't make it less of a bubble it just it makes it uh, uncomfortable to talk about and i think that is what we, we see right now 
Well, hopefully some are heeding the warning. Heinrich, some say that residential real estate is fairly valued, but interest rates are too high. And once those come back down, more people will enter the housing market and more houses will sell. Others are saying that housing is in a bubble and once rates come back down, more supply will come online, driving values down hard as there will be no buyers for the supply and large price cuts will hit the market from desperate sellers. What do you see coming for residential real estate? I think we're going to see a decline in, uh, in, in real estate here again. And, uh, and it's actually, we have already seen that some of the related uh, indices that, that, uh, that, that, you know, is related to the, the real estate market is, has been declining. Uh, yes, prices have stayed up somewhat high, uh, but I think, uh, I think that we will see as people start, unfortunately, to become unemployed, that people will have to sell their homes. And this is something quite different. Yes, interest rate can again move down, but, but that's, that's where you have two things. I mean, you, first of all, you want to keep your home. Yes. And you could do that. Even if interest rates are high, you will struggle with it. But the moment you lose your job because the, the economy is rolling over, then you'll have to sell your house. And I think we're going to see that again. I think we're going to see a rather strong decline in, in, in uh, housing as well. But I think that is going to be, uh, again, th this time around, I think probably it's going to be shorter lasting. And I think it will shoot up rather fast again, especially because of all the money that will be pumped into to the economy and a stagflation would not be bad for the housing market. So, so that's why I think you could see that there, it will be a short term dip, but, but then things can come back again because that will be, uh, it will be a good place to put the money in. Again, though, there is the downside or, or the, the pull down from the uh, high, much higher unemployment rate that I, that I see coming as well. So Warren Buffett recently sold more than 50% of his Apple stake and billions in Bank of America, too. He now sits on a ridiculous cash pile of more than $276 billion. What does the sale of the, these two very specific companies and sectors tell you, and what message should we be taking from the historically enormous cash pile that Buffett is building? Well, so he's known to be the, well, probably the best investor in the world, and he has a long-term perspective, and he's been good at you know moving out of in in and out of the markets over the years. So I think we should take notice of what he does, and it plays into the the also the the scenario that I see unfolding. I don't think he necessarily sells on the top here. I think there is be um, at least in the market, in the general market, in general U.S. market, there will be a fifteen twenty percent move from here uh, higher. Uh, so I think that can be. Um, a lot of uh, you know upside still to to, to be seen, but uh, in the bigger perspective, I think he's correct. He's seeing uh, the the economy is also coming to uh, the business cycle rolling over. I guess I would love to see how he does it, and then uh, that he's simply saying, well, you know, it's better to sit on on the cash now and have, have you know all the opportunities in the world to to buy in at uh, at low prices later later on. I think he's doing, I think he's doing it uh, you know uh, right on and. Uh, he doesn't need to time the market exactly with with the, you know these kinds of moves here. He has done well over the years in terms of uh, you know riding Apple and which one was the other one by the way you said Apple and which one I yeah don't Bank of that. America Bank of America Bank of America that is actually quite interesting that you that that you say that because I just looked at it the other day to to search for clues of uh, the, the, uh, the uh, potential. Um, uh, potential banking crisis and uh, financial crisis. And, and what I see there with Banking of America is that you can uh, potentially or likely see a very strong decline in Banking of America, Bank of America from here. So, so I think that uh, sounds correct also to me. So, uh, and Apple also have been, may have one more move up, but I think that is also very close. So I, I actually think the FANG stocks have, uh, have topped out here as well. So, so I think it sounds good to me what he does. And I think we, the rest of us, we should just uh, pay notice to what he does. So you see a 15 to 20 percent move higher. So that's your blow off top prediction. You're also calling for this recession after the blow off top. In fact, you've stated that you believe that the recession is going to be the worst since the 1929 Great Depression. When do you expect the Great Recession to kick off? Is that the, the December, January, you know, the, the flip of the calendar? Uh, and, and what are going to be some of the defining characteristics of this great recession that you see coming our way that people need to be looking out for? So, yeah, actually, it is in that kind of timeline. And if you look at it, we, as I started out by saying, also, there are so many similarities to what we saw into the 2007-2008 setup. And when I say the 15% upside is uh, because of actually the, the um, similarities to what we saw in the uh, S&P 500 
with the Nikkei, with the DAX also, compared to that with everything we see with the VIX and so on, it's a very, very similar pattern. And the, uh, what I say, the deterioration in the, in, in the S&P that I see, which means that even though prices, price is going up, you actually can see in the momentum of it, in the strength of it, that is actually waning. And that means that you can see that it, 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 there will be a top in it at a later point. But the structure tells me that we go like 15, 20% higher from the levels we were at uh, around Monday, I would say. Uh, and if you look at it in 2007, from the point we were uh, in August to uh, 2007 to where we got in October, where the top was, was also 15%. It's only by coincidence that I took again see that it's actually 15. I think 20% this time is more uh, right, but it's in that in that uh, you know level. Um, so and that means that we will reach it uh, by October. That is that's the best guess right now based on what we see with the uh, the yield also coming down. With uh, and there I also have some some indicators starting to play in uh, to, to 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 give an indication. And as we move closer, I will be able to to better say when it is, but. I have, I have 18 indicators, uh, recession indicators that will give us a good heads up on when I think the recession sets in. And, uh, and I think that will be uh, around December, as I said, also. And yes, could it be the January? Sure. But it, it's in that timeline. And everybody that talks about 2025, 2026 or something like that should start looking at the business cycle. We are in, you know, so close to the end of this. Doesn't mean the end to the, to this. That's why I call it a blow off top, because you'll see other markets around the world actually having topped out. But you'll see the U.S. market moving 15, 20 percent higher, and 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 then the recession will come soon after. And then you said, what will be the um, the characteristics of this crisis? And I think the characteristics will be that this will not be just. Be, there are different types of crises, different types of, the, of of bear markets, and and one will be when when inflation moves up. We had sort of that when we saw the um, when we saw 20, uh, 2022, where we saw inflation coming up, and we saw that. We had a what I still call it a correction, even though it was a big one. Um, it was not a recession. So what we will see this time around, I think, is that we will first see a deflationary bust, which means that uh, it's the normal thing that we see into the financial crisis. Uh, markets are starting to uh, to decline because, uh, yeah, values are you know disappearing, so to speak, because we see uh, you know uh, uh, you know black swan. We see uh, banks in Japan. Something happens there that can have global consequences and we'll see that has a contagion effect into to other uh, countries as well uh, and, and into the US. And then when the Fed then steps in later on, because that will go on for a little while, the Fed one first will say, yeah, we'll make sure we'll adjust rates, we'll do a little. And at some point they'll say, okay, this is bad. Something's happening. Something is teetering here. Something is uh, wobbling, uh, something big. Then they'll say, okay, we get in, we move in with a big you know, bazooka and they will put all the money into the that, that, that we think it needs. Markets will respond to that. We'll see a bounce in the market. But that's when I think we'll see a little different kind of uh, unfolding than what we saw after the financial crisis. Because after the financial crisis, that was the, that was it. We, we did it and we the free money, you know, long live free money was then, you know, helping us to push values up. And we saw the, the consumer starting to spend that money and we all took on extra debt which then has caused the, uh, the, 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 the economy, the economy to, to rise. I think this time around, as I said, I think the, the, the consumer is a little more reluctant to that. That's why I think there will be a second decline and an actual stagflation defaulting after, uh, developing after that uh, small six months bounce, if I had to guess. So, so my, my thesis is decline into mid of 25, a strong decline, the Fed jumps in mid to 25, and then we see a bounce into the rest of the year. 2026 will then be something completely different. And that will be where we see it, uh, stagflation. And if you are a normal investor and you have a 40, 60 kind of uh, portfolio, or you just say, I'll, I'm going to get, you know, I'll sit with my stocks here. You're going to see a lot of destruction in your, in your portfolio. And that's why it requires a little more active, uh, uh, yeah, you know, activity or act, active understanding of your of your portfolio and why you are in the in the in the investments that you're in over the next years. Because what you're in into end of this year will be quite different. What you need to be in when you get into Q1, which will be quite different from what you need to be in Q3 next year, and then again different from what you need to be in Q1 uh, 26. As I see it, I try to do this based on you know assumptions of, on what I see, but but it seems to be playing out. 
So you've mentioned the consumer a few times. Consumer confidence is breathtakingly low. So are consumer savings. Credit cards, loan balances, they're sky high. Defaults are rising. Consumers are choosing, like we said earlier, what bill to pay, what not to pay. McDonald's, Big Lots, Wayfair, Walgreens, and so many others. Starbucks. They're cra- yes. Yeah, they're yeah. cratering. Um, yeah. They all cater to the general consumer, and all of them are getting destroyed. Heinrich, the outlook for the bottom one half to two thirds of the consumers really looks terribly bleak. What happens next for them due to the conditions that these consumers find themselves in? First, you tell me why they call it a soft landing. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but 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 that that I mean, what happens to them? Well, I, I unfortunately I, I have to say that the next thing that's coming is is high unemployment. And I, I and I fear that that's going to hit exactly those people that that that, that need them the job the most and the money that you know the paycheck the most. So I, I think that this is uh, you know coming at a bad time for for yeah for everybody, but but especially also for for this uh, this lower third of the uh, of the economy. Um, and and with that again back to my when when the Fed then starts to do QE, well, are you sure they're going to spend that money as to the degree that is needed to get the bounce in the market? Oh, in the, sorry, in the economy, not in the market, in the economy. I don't think it will. So, so, uh, yeah, I, unemployment, unfortunately, is what is coming to 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 that uh, that part, a lot of the, these people, unfortunately. Okay, so you see a blow off top coming into the election time frame. Then you see a bottoming that's not going to stop until mid twenty twenty five. That's going to lead the Fed to injecting massive amounts of helicopter money, which is going to lead to stagflation. Do, is that correct? Okay. Correct. So with that, with, with that being the case, what levels do you see the S&P, NASDAQ, gold, silver, copper, the miners, oil? What do you see them going to in the blow off top? Then what do you, where do you see them going into the decline? And then where do you see them coming out in, in uh, you know, mid, starting in mid-25 go and onward? So let's see if I can remember it. So the S&P, I said, I have 6,100 around that level. I have the, for the NASDAQ, I have around 23,500, I think, and uh, around that level again. And then for the, the miners, you said, you mean the, the gold miners there? Yeah. GDX. Yeah, I I think we have seen the top in that for now. And I think uh, that actually gold will also start to pay notice to uh, uh, that we have a deflationary environment unfolding. So liquidity will start to become a problem. That is probably what I think happened also on Monday. Somebody needed liquidity. Why would the sell off of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum? Because that is the easiest way to get some uh, get the liquidity if you're, you know, you're holding some. And that was why it didn't really spread into the to the altcoins, whereas uh, of course it did, but not to the degree you would have seen if, if you saw uh, Ethereum, for instance, were down like it was. So I think when it comes to uh, to gold and silver, they will they will act as what they need to do, especially gold, which is the guarantee that you can have liquidity into a deflationary bust. That is why people are so keen on investing in gold, because you say you need to have gold into a, in a, into a crisis. Correct, because you, then you know that you'll have whole liquidity when liquidity is scarce. Uh, and when the, the when the gold is really moving up, it's actually when things are getting onto the other side again, and there is a new a, a, a credit impulse coming. Then you want to hold uh, gold, uh, and and in order for for it to to move up. Um, so I think uh, you'll see gold also to taking a, a tumble at some point, and and I think GDX actually seems like it has a top tier and is going to decline. Uh, what was it else you said? Which other assets? Yeah, I'm curious about what you think about copper and oil as well. Copper and oil, I, I think uh, copper also, again, we call it Dr. Copper. I think it also has topped, and I think we're going to see that uh, declining. Can't remember the level that I, I think we will see, but I think the top is there as well uh, because it tells us that the economy is now starting to, to slow, uh, and oil the same. Uh, oil has also had it, seen its top. It topped in at 100 and, was 120, and then it's been coming steadily down ever since. We have been in a uh, sideways consolidation for a little while, and I think we're going to see a stronger decline uh, coming soon there as well. When the recession is is, is setting in, then then we'll see that. I think we we'll see oil down to ten dollars again, uh, which uh, I called in two thousand nineteen, and it was you know people really really didn't like that uh, or didn't believe in that. I think we're going to see oil at ten dollars again before we are out of the uh, deflationary bust. 
How low do you see the S&P, the NASDAQ, gold, silver? How low do you see those going into the bust? I think for the, for the again, into the bust, I think that's something different than after the full extent of the crisis. Uh, so I think, oh, I can't remember these levels I buy my, on, on my head, on top of my head right now. But Well, okay, so 6,100 yeah. 6, on S&P is your peak. Do you see a 50% drop? Do you see a bigger than 50% drop? I, I, I see that into, let's say, into the deflationary bust. I think we had a low in, uh, let me remember this correctly. I think it was in October 22. We actually were around 3,600, that, that's in 22 of, uh, on the S&P, I think. I think we will, that will be the first part of the, de that will be the deflationary part of it. And that means then we'll see a bounce from there. And then I think you're going to see down to around 1,800 on the S&P. Wow. So you're calling for, yeah. what is that, 60, 60 to 70%. Yes, on the S and P, yes, and if you see some of the, if you see the small caps, you're going to see up to eighty percent decline in that. In the total, not just in the first part of it. And again, yes, yeah. the Fed will jump in, but we have to consider we have a two hundred percent market capitalization to GDP. And if you start to do that, and you look at where things could be, and that you also see a potential move below the level or that you know the the normal level, the return to average, or then you could see the, those kinds of levels. Again, I would like to see these things uh, starting to develop, but but I think that uh, we are way, way uh, overvalued, uh, overvalued here. Um, I can't remember the NASDAQ, sorry. I think gold has surprised me to the upside, I'll say. But uh, but I think, you know, if you look to silver and the palladium, platinum, you'll see that they actually haven't followed gold to the upside. So so gold is the outlier here compared to the rest of the pack. And and I think into the, uh, into the deflationary bust, you could see it down to all the way down potentially to uh, to 1200 1250 uh, i think it could be could also be higher but uh, but i think it, it is a risk that it could drop as much do you see the nasdaq dropping as much as the s p 60 to 70 percent or more i i think there's a risk that it can drop more i, I just don't have the levels here right now i can't remember that i have i kept that uh, most again i i will also when we start to see the top coming in I will see. I'll try to do the estimations on where I see the um, the, the the bottom, where I can see that uh, potentially unfolding. But uh, but yeah, all because you have a lot of the the startups, the new yeah, the new small businesses in the Nasdaq potentially will, will will drop a lot. And again, I'm not talking from the current levels. I'm talking from a level that is potentially twenty percent higher than where we are today. Yeah. So you see the S and P dropping maybe seventy percent. You see the Nasdaq dropping. Uh, before bottoming, um, you see the NASDAQ dropping probably more than 70%. You see the small caps dropping 80%. You see gold dropping at least 50%. You see oil dropping 70 plus percent. Then they come in with the helicopter money at that point. That's no, that's way. that's actually that's the full. I mean, if it when you get down to the 78%, that's the full extent of the entire. So that means okay, that so when they you actually have the. The Fed actually they come in they, earlier. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll come in after six months or, you know, worth of decline. That's why I'm saying I think on the S&P, I think I can remember that. I think I have it at the target around three and a half, 3,500, 600 around okay, there. Okay, okay. That's when I think they will see the bounce. Uh, and I think it would be a significant bounce over six months because obviously the Fed is not just going to sit idle and do nothing about this. They will come in. But again, that's where I think that we, we, we will see a different kind of unfolding okay. than we saw after 2007, uh, 2009. S so a 30 to 40 percent drop in the s p is going to draw in the fed yes and get the, and and get them to to act and they're going to unleash you know low rates they're going to unleash um money like we've never seen before probably bigger than the pandemic spend correct yes exactly and that is yeah. uh, i mean they they're going to expand their balance sheets like like crazy and uh, they will uh, in order they will think okay we need to pour money on this and there will be a need for it uh, because if I'm, if what I see in the deflationary bust and of the size that I see, um, well, then there will be a need for a lot of dollars in the system. So, so yes, they will, and they will try to force the dollar lower because at the, at the top of the deflationary bust, I think the dollar reaches 120 on the Dixie. So, if I'm right on that, there will be that will create a lot of havoc in the world and the, in the uh, economic system. And then is it at that point moving forward that you're expecting commodities, gold, silver, oil, et cetera, to take Correct. off in cost, but yet we're going to stagnate on the growth side. We're going to stagnate with higher unemployment. So there's going to be a lot of suffering in terms of folks not 
more folks being out of work than normal, higher costs for everything. Is it, is that the world that you're, you're seeing? Exactly. That that's the world I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you, if you start to, when you have this bus, that's what will be on, you know, the starting uh, you know, point of the, you know, uh, of the, of the crisis in the way that we see a, a you know, deflationary bust and the Fed will treat it like that. And I'm uh, ho hoping or understanding that, okay, now we'll have to get in again, like what we did, you know, in, in so many times before. But again, I think this time around, that is going to create something quite different because there is this disconnect of this misunderstanding of the consumer that we, if the consumer does not start to spend this money in the way that they should, well, then it will be more sluggish on the real economy. And that's why, as you say, you know, you'll start to see the commodity the bubble move higher. That's what I, I, I predict. And that's why I also, I, you know, I'll be ready for the moment when the Fed comes out and say, okay, now here it is, you know, just loads and loads of, of money coming onto, this, onto the system. Uh, or into the economy, uh, well, then I will be buying gold, silver, gold uh, miners with arms and legs here because it, it will be a fantastic moment for those to take off after what I see as a 13 years uh, correction. I see after 2011, you actually saw these 13 years where they we haven't really seen, seen anything. And people that are talking about gold moving from you know, to 2400 or whatever it is at, this is nothing compared to what we're going to see. I mean, nothing. We're going to see 10,000, 15,000, you know, on gold. And that's going to go up like, like uh, you know, uh, really, pretty really quick within a couple of years, you'll be in, in, in those levels. That is the gold cycle. That is where we want to invest in. So this is what people are talking about, you know, small uh, rallies in gold and silver so much lower than we were still at 2011. Uh, that's not been the, this has been part of the, of the correction that we're in. And the moment we step into the next, uh, the next environment here where we see a potential stagflation unfolding because of what the Fed could do, well, that's when you want to be in commodities. Everything that has, you know, um, yeah, a commodity can be grains, it can be uranium, it can be gold, silver, whatever, they will move up, you know, a lot. What can the average consumer do to protect themselves um, from this coming crash that you're seeing? Well, I think it'll be very, very difficult. And I think that will, for, for a lot of people, because there will, will be few that will understand that this kind of whip, whiplash that we're going to see first, you know, into something, then into something different. And you see this, you know, back and forth. So, so a lot of people are unfortunately going to go right through it just with, you know, staying with their investments or maybe a 60 40, and then they're going to get crushed into a stagflation. Uh, what they can do is that they should actually try to navigate in this and, and, and get, you know, the right of the a hold of the right people that, that may be able to see this, what, what's going on for them. Um, but, but they also have to understand that at some point cash may be king at, you know, that, that could be one way to say it. If you hold cash over the next, uh, coming years, they could be actually be okay. Uh, because then you can buy in at the investment portfolio you're holding today. Uh, good. But another, one other thing would be also to say, okay, I, I could be holding, you know, treasuries into the deflationary bust and then getting out of treasuries and then holding cash into the stagflation, uh, maybe getting into miners as well also. But it'll be very difficult for people to navigate. And I think that that's uh, that's where they need to have proper uh, financial advisors uh, to support them. Well, Heinrich, this has been a compelling conversation. Before we wrap up here and I ask you the final question, I want to point everyone over to our sub stack. It is free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer economy markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all the expert interviews that we conduct just like this one. They're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed this conversation with Heinrich as much as I have. Please let him know. Hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video. It's now time for our golden nuggets segment, Heinrich. Let's discuss portfolio positioning, Based on all that we've discussed today and with your experience and worldview as the backdrop, how are you positioning for the next 12 months? What assets do you like and what assets do you absolutely want to stay away from? So right now I'm into, uh, I'm into risk assets. I'm into crypto. As I, I think I can ride the bubble and I, uh, I think there will be a, 
an upside in crypto that is uh, unlike anything we've seen before. I think it'll be an absolute euphoria. Do I believe it in the long term? Um, 99% of them, no, I do not. And that's why I will get out of it at the point when I think the, uh, we see the, the top of the market. And that, that from that point on, I will be uh, trying to go into long positions, long the dollar, uh, has, having as much cash exposure, not just long uh, in terms of sitting on cash, but actually sitting on positions which are shorting uh, other uh, currencies against the dollar. Uh, so, so that is the, the positions, positions in the in let's say the shorter time frame. But by mid next year, I will be buying gold and silver and miners, uh, like uh, with, as I said, with arms and legs. <laughs> Is there anything that you're staying away from right now that you just think needs to don't even go near it? Well, I, I uh, yeah, I wouldn't invest in any uh, foreign countries right now. I wouldn't invest in, uh, in my Danish stocks here. I wouldn't invest in, 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 in uh, Japanese stocks or anywhere, anything like that. I wouldn't I wouldn't be holding uh, gold and silver also right now at this point here because I think there will be this uh, credit crunch. Uh, but but that will change over the next year. Well, Heinrich, thank you so much for coming on to the Metals and Miners podcast, for being so generous with your time, your analysis, your ideas. It's been incredible to spend the time with you. Would you please share with the viewers what's the overall theme that you want to leave with those tuning in? Where can they learn more about your work and how can they connect with you? Well, I think the best way is simply just to go to X uh, or Twitter, as I still like to call it, and uh, find me at Henrik Seberg. And uh, well, you know, if there's anything they want to discuss, I am always, I always like to be challenged on my views. And uh, there's nothing better than to have some sort of new angle perspective uh, that I haven't thought of. Uh, and then, you know, having a good discussion, a uh, conversation with somebody. So, 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 you know, most, you know, definitely you should reach out if you have any, something you want to, you know, discuss with me. And what about your website? Well, yes. Uh, so uh, I am uh, part of uh, SwissBlock. Uh, I'm a head uh, macroeconomist of SwissBlock, but also we have the I have the uh, the Seberg report also, where we can also find uh, the report that we do that we do on a uh, on a frequent basis and on a weekly basis. So I'm going to put all that information up there with links. Everybody, go follow Heinrich if you don't already. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge. He's sharing constantly on Twitter his views and. Um, I really appreciate you. I look forward to having you back on and thank you for being here with us and everybody else. Thank you for watching. Thank you. I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It is free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer economy markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all the expert interviews that we conduct just like this one, they're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us.